You can open your Bibles to the Gospel of John chapter 3. And uh, we're going to read the first 15 verses of the text. Uh, we're only going to uh, probably teach on the first 8 verses um, due to time constraints. So we'll read the first of 15 verses of John chapter 3. And we'll commence to teach on the passage. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So we see here that uh, Nicodemus, by name, he is a Pharisee. The Pharisees were an elite uh, religious group, the most conservative in the land of Israel at the time of Christ. It's estimated that there was only about 6,000 Pharisees in all of Israel. And Nicodemus is one of them. He's, uh, you might say it this way, this is a conservative denomination. And he's in that conservative denomination. And not only is he in the conservative denomination, he's a leader. He's a ruler of the Jews. He's a member, therefore, of the Sanhedrin, which was a group of 70 men that uh, was the leadership. They were, if you will, the Supreme Court uh, of Israel. And he is called, in verse 10, Jesus calls him the teacher of Israel. And so he is, uh, apparently has a lofty position among the Sanhedrin. He's viewed as a preeminent teacher. Uh, he's someone that people go to for uh, counsel, for wisdom, for advice, for knowledge. He is a teacher of the law. He's a teacher of the law of Moses. He is a master of the Old Testament scriptures. Uh, he is uh, the teacher of Israel. And there is certainly an application here for us today. He has the right pedigree. He's from the right family. He's got the right last name. He's got the right connection. He's got the right education. He's got all the, uh, the notoriety. He's well known. He is uh, a person of prestige and title. He has position. He has security. He is a person that is prominent. He has everything. All his ducks are in a row. And leave it to Jesus to give this man the uh, surprising and astonishing fact that indeed Nicodemus, with all of his uh, credentials, 
is not in the kingdom of God, but is in fact outside of the kingdom of God. That Nicodemus lacks something, and what he lacks is spiritual life. He's not born again. He is not born of the Spirit of God. He's well credentialed. If, if he was applying for pastor of your church, you would probably hire Nicodemus. Because he checks all the boxes, he dots all the I's, he crosses all the T's, and he's just what you're looking for in an external manner. But there's something that he lacks, he's not born again. And I wonder today, how many people think that they're born again, but they are not born again. They check all the boxes, they cross all the T's, they dot all the I's from an external perspective. You would think that they're saved, you would think that they know the Lord, and you come to find out later that they may be in church, but they're not in Christ. You find out real quickly that they may know people, they may have the right connections, uh, but they don't know the Lord. They are dutiful in their piety and religiosity, but they're not born again. And that is Jesus' indictment against this individual, Nicodemus, uh, that you have all of these external things down, but there's something you lack. You do not have the life of God in you. You are not born again. So you get into verse 3, and this is exactly uh, what Jesus does. He, he kind of breaks things down for Nicodemus and humbles Nicodemus. Jesus answered. Now I love this. Jesus answered, and Nicodemus hasn't even asked the question yet. Nicodemus doesn't ask a question. In fact, Nicodemus comes and he's, he's buttering Jesus up. He's being very respectful. Hey, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God in verse 2. And no one can do these things or do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answers his, uh, you know, his buttering him up and everything. And he says, listen, let me get right to the chase. Let me get right down to what matters here and he begins to talk to him about being born again. He says, Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly. And, and the words here, most assuredly, uh, depending on what translation you have. If you have King James, it's verily, verily. If you have the NASB, it's truly, truly. Um, I think if you have the nearly inspired version, it's very truly. And uh, here, the words in the Greek are actually the words, amen, amen. Jesus starts off his message to him by saying amen. And he says it twice for the sake of emphasis. Amen, amen means this is true. So be it. This is a true statement. What I'm about to say to you is absolute truth. It, it's kind of like when in here I say, hey, listen to me. Right? Well, what am I doing? I'm trying to get your attention because what I'm about to say is true. And that's what Jesus is doing. In fact, he's going to do that three times. In this passage, verse 5 and verse 11 as well, he's going to say, Amen, Amen. Amen, Amen. He's going to get his attention. And he says, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So notice the first thing that he talks to him about is being born again. And the term, Jesus uses this term, born again, or born of the Spirit five times between verses 3 through 8. Five different times. It is the main point that Jesus is trying to make to him. And he is, he is uh, comparing, if you will, our spiritual birth, being born again, with physical birth. And there are different parallels that you can draw from your physical birth to your spiritual birth. There's, there's, there's different parallels that can be drawn. Number one, think of physical birth and when you are born physically, it happens at a specific time. Right? You have a birth certificate and that birth certificate, it has the date of your birth, it has the, you know, hey, you were born at... You know, 1024 a.m. on July 24th, 2022. It's time stamped 
It's a specific happening, a specific time, a specific day that it happened. And likewise with being born again, it is a specific event that happens at a specific time. And you can, you can know when that is. And that's the second point. If you're born, you know that you've been born. Everybody knows that you've been born. If I, if I asked in here, how many of you have been born? Every hand would go up because it's obvious if you're alive, you have been born. Well, likewise, just as you can know if you've been born, you should be able to know if you've been born again. It is discernible. It is knowable. It is recognizable. Uh, number three point that you can make here is that it only happens once. If you are born physically, you're not born physically twice. You're born physically once. Likewise, when you're born again or born of the Spirit of God, it is something that happens to you one time. You're not born again, again, again. You're just born again. You're, you're born from above one time. It happens once. And the last point, the last parallel between the two, is simply this, and this is the most profound point, perhaps. And that is this. That when you are um, born physically, you have nothing to do with it. You, you did not, you, you didn't give birth to yourself. Your mother gave birth to you. It's not something you do, and that's the whole point of what Jesus is teaching here. He's saying this is something you don't do. This is something that is done to you. And, and so, likewise, when you're born again or born of the Spirit or born of God, this is something that you're not in control of. This is not something you do. This is not something that, you know, Jesus does not, you know, tell Nicodemus how to be born again. He doesn't say, this is a prayer you can pray to be born again. He doesn't say, if you believe, then you'll be born again. No, being born again is something that happens to you. This is a work of God. This is something God does. This is not something you do. And that is the point of this, this message that Jesus is saying is, Hey, Nicodemus, you check all these external boxes, but let me tell you something. There's something that you cannot do, that only God can do in you, and if it is not done... You cannot see and you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And you know, that makes people, and it made him, it, it makes people very uncomfortable, very anxious. Because when you tell people, hey, there's something that needs to happen to you, and if it doesn't happen to you, it's not something you can do, it's something outside of you. And if it doesn't happen to you, you can't see nor can you enter the kingdom of God. Because now it's totally out of your hands, and now it's totally in God's hands, and now you're, you're, you're totally dependent on God doing this, otherwise it doesn't happen. And if it doesn't happen, then you cannot see, nor can you enter. So just like you didn't contribute anything to your physical birth other than you were just along for the ride, it's the same way that you don't contribute anything to your spiritual birth. You are simply along for the ride. It's not something you did. It is something God does. It is a work of God. It's solely a work of God. In theology, we would call it monergistic. monergistic. It is something that is solely done by God Himself. And He goes on here, and, he, and in talking about this, and He says that... Um, yeah, let me do this. Let me, let me, uh, I'm going to back up just a, a page here and I'm going to look at John chapter 1 verse 12 and 13. Because this will substantiate that this is exactly what Jesus is teaching. That this is not something you do. This is something that is done to you. It's a work of God. And without God doing this work in you, you cannot see nor enter the kingdom of God. Uh, John 1 verse 12 and 13 says this. Now, 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 now hear this. But as many as received Him... To them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. So there's people that received, the people that received are the people that believed in Jesus. But notice verse 13. Who were the people who believed in Jesus? Verse 13 tells you. Who were born, not of blood. So, so not of blood, hear me. Salvation is not hereditary. 
You're not saved because you're born into a certain family. You're not saved because of, you have the same last name as somebody. You're not saved because your dad is saved, your grandparents are saved, your mom is saved, or whoever. Salvation is not hereditary. It's not of blood. Right? Think of Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a descendant of Abraham. A physical descendant of Abraham. And yet he needs to be born again. He needs to be born of God. Always remember that salvation is individual and personal. It's never corporate. It is individual. It is personal. You must be born again. You, specifically you, must be born again. So it's not a blood, it's not hereditary. You, you can't just say, well, because I'm saved, my son is saved, my daughter is saved. No, they need to believe in Jesus Christ and be saved as well. Nor of the will of the flesh, right? This is, uh, the will of the flesh is self-effort. Um, this would be works, law-keeping, uh, much like Nicodemus. He was a law-keeper, he's, he's, he's self-effort and doing good works, trying to be saved. And then he goes on, nor the will of man. It's not by, it's not by your choice. It's not uh, self-will, self-determination. He goes on here and he says this, nor the will of man, but of God. Born of God. In other words, God is the one who wills this to happen, and God is the one who accomplishes this. This is not something that you do, this is something God does. It's not, your, it's not your family tree. It's not the will of the flesh. It's not the, your, your individual self-will and self-determination. It is something that is of God. This is something God does. And if God doesn't do it, it doesn't get done. Something you're totally dependent on Him for is what He's talking about. And in verse 3 again, he concludes this verse by telling us that uh, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He gives us, hear me, this is so important, this right here would be worth an entire message just by itself. One of the evidences of being born again is that you can see. You, you now have spiritual sight. You can see things that other people can't see. You can see spiritual things that other people can't see. You, you can see things in the Word that other people can hear and not see. You, see. you see truth. You see truth about yourself. You see truth about God. You see truth in the Bible. You see truth about Christ. It, it's, it's spiritual sight that comes to you. That is evidence of being born again. If you cannot see... It is indicative of the fact that a person is not born again. In fact, this is so profound that, uh, and you don't have to follow me here, I'm trying to, to be cognizant of the time here. Um, it's one of my favorite verses in all of the book of Acts. Just hear me. Acts 26, verse 18. This is, uh, this is the Apostle Paul speaking to King Agrippa and he's recounting his conversion experience to Christ. And he's recounting what Jesus told him. So this is Jesus speaking to Paul. And Paul is reciting it to, uh, to King Agrippa. Alright? Now listen to what he says. This is what Jesus tells him. Verse 17. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you. Gentiles, the nations of the world. Now listen to this. This is what he's going to do. To open their eyes. Why, why is Paul being sent by God to the Gentiles? To open their eyes. Well, what eyes? Not their physical eyes. They can see with their physical eyes. It's not their physical eyes that are in jeopardy. It's their spiritual eyes. To open the, the, the eyes of their understanding so that they can see the truth. And he says, I'm sending you to open their eyes Right? In other words, Paul, you're going to preach, and when you preach, the Spirit is going to move. There's going to be a new birth that will take place, and the first thing that will happen is they're going to see. And, and when they can see, the, the, the consequence of seeing is this, in order to turn 
them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. In other words, when their eyes are open to the truth, the, the, the consequence of that is they're going to be converted. They're going to repent. They're going to turn. They're going to turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. Right? Here's another indication that if a person is born again, if a person is born again, they will necessarily turn. They will turn from darkness to light and from Satan to God. If there is no turning, guess what else there isn't? There's no born again. They're, they're not born again. This is so important. This is like, you know, uh, Christianity 101. But Christianity 101 slaps you in the face and says, well, wait a minute. If you can't see, you're not born again. And if you haven't turned, you're not born again. And he goes on, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So this, this, this regeneration, this new birth, brings about open eyes, a turning of the heart. You receive forgiveness and an inheritance, and, and you're sanctified by faith in the Messiah, in Christ. Going back again to John chapter 3, I've got to get through at least verse 8. So I'm just going to skip to verse 5 and then skip to, uh, to verse 8 as far as expounding on it. Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Um, understand what it means to be born of the Spirit. And in verse 8, he's going to use the metaphor of wind to help us to understand what it means to be born of the Spirit. And uh, when, when Jesus refers here to water, I didn't always see this, but, but I, I think what Jesus is doing is, um, you got to remember, Nicodemus is a teacher of the law. He knows the, the Old Testament Scriptures backwards and forwards. He knows the law and the prophets. I believe what Jesus is doing is he's taking him to Ezekiel 36, um, which, which is a prophecy about the new birth, about the new covenant, and what would take place in the new covenant. I'm just going to read it to you quickly. Ezekiel 36, verses 25 through 27. Watch this. Hear me. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Right? So he's not talking about physical water and physical purification. He's talking about spiritual purification. Water is just being used uh, uh, in, in an illustrative sense, right? He's going to cleanse us. He's going to wash us. Uh, and then I will give you a new heart, put a new spirit within you. I will hear these words. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. So here's another indicator of being born again. If you have a heart of stone, Think about a stone, right? The water hits the stone. The stone doesn't absorb any water. Just whatever. It's, it's, a, it's rock hard. It's, it's, it's a stone. It's calloused. It's, 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 it, it, nothing penetrates it. But he's going to give you, he's going to take out that heart of stone and he's going to give you a heart of flesh, soft, pliable, uh, you're going to have a tender conscience, a tender heart toward the Lord. Right? If you're born again, you have a tender heart. You're, you're not calloused and hard and cold and dead and just nothing penetrates the heart. You're not stubborn and calloused and all these other things. No, there's a tenderness of heart. There's a, uh, uh, in your heart, the, the, God can poke your heart and, oh, man, I felt that. I, I, need, to, I need to do better or whatever it is. There's a tenderness of heart that takes place. <clears throat> so I will give you a heart of flesh. And notice this, verse 27. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. So notice this. God says, I will five times. I'm going to cleanse you. I'm going to cleanse the vessel. Because why? Because I'm going to take out that old stony heart. I'm going to give you a soft, tender heart. And then I'm going to put my spirit in you. And these things, it's a cause and effect relationship. Now this, all of these things is going to cause you to want to keep my judgments and my statutes and do them. Right? It's not us doing this by ourselves. It's God moving in us and causing these things to take place. That's what it is to be born again. 
And then he goes on from there, verse, uh, verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. In other words, uh, right? He's just talking about the two different types of births there are. There's physical and spiritual. The flesh, the physical, can only give birth to the physical. And God, the Spirit of God, can only give birth to the spiritual life. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again, right? This is a divine necessity. This is not something that's optional. This isn't one of those things where that doesn't matter. He says, you must be born again. This is, this is a necessity. In verse 8, and I'm gonna, we're going to conclude in verse 8, and this, I'll probably say some of the most profound things in verse 8. So I hope that you'll listen. Give me five to, you know, eight and a half minutes. <laughs> All right, verse 8. This is profound. Listen to what he says. He's now going to uh, liken the, this being born again, this born of the Spirit, this new birth, the work of the Spirit of God to do this, he's going to liken it to wind. Now follow me. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it. It cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. So everyone that is born of the Spirit, it's just like the wind. What does that mean? Well, there's, there's a few things that it means. Number one, uh, the wind is sovereign. You don't control when the wind starts, when the wind stops. You don't tell the wind what direction to go. The wind starts when it wants to start. It stops when it wants to stop, and it goes the direction it wants to go. Did anybody out there last night control the wind? You had no control over the wind, didn't you? None. Likewise with the Spirit. You have no control over when the Spirit moves, where the Spirit moves, or on whom the Spirit moves. He is sovereign. He does what He wants, when He wants, where He wants, on whom He wants. The second, the second point here is that the work of the Spirit, just as wind, wind is invisible. You don't see wind. What do you see? You see the effects of wind. I, can't, I couldn't see the wind last night, but you know, I could see the tree branches bending. I could see my neighbor's flags flapping in the wind. I could see the tassels on the corn blowing in the wind. I can see the effects of wind, but I can't see the wind. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. If you're born of the Spirit, you don't see the Spirit move, but you see the effects of where the Spirit has moved. You see the... My eyes are open now. I can see the kingdom of God. Now I can enter. I can take that first step through the narrow gate onto the narrow path and enter the kingdom of God. I, I can now believe in Christ. I can now repent and turn and turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Now all of a sudden, I, 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 these things are happening. All of a sudden, my heart is softened. It's not stony heart anymore. It's a soft heart. Right? There's evidences of being born again. Right? One of the evidences of being born again, uh, according to 1 John chapter 4, is love for the brotherhood. Loving your, your neighbor as yourself is an evidence of being born again. So he, he goes from this, and then the, the third part would be this, is that the, the wind is, uh, how shall we say, there's an element of mystery to it, right? Um, he, he says here in the, in the verse, let's see how he says it exactly, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who's born of the Spirit. There's an element of mystery to it. Right? In other words, um, when it comes to being born again, sometimes it's the people that you least expect to be born again that are born again. And it's the people that you most expect are born again that are not born again. Right? Think, think about Jesus. Jesus didn't go, hear me, he didn't go to the Pharisees and pick out the 12 best Pharisees. He didn't go and pick the 12 best members of the Sanhedrin. 
He, he doesn't do like we do today. What we do today is we, we think in terms of just purely physical, right? And, and we want to get the most qualified individual. Jesus didn't get the most qualified people. He went and he chose the unlikely people to do the unusual things that he had called them to. Right? You, you don't, you know, you know, there's a sense of mystery to it. Like, why, why did you save them and you didn't save this person? Why, why are they born again and this person isn't born again? There's an element of mystery to it. Why did you go get fishermen instead of uh, guys in the Sanhedrin that are already educated? Because if you go get people from the Sanhedrin, you've got to re-educate all those people again. It'd be easy to just go get fishermen and teach them from scratch. Amen. In closing. In closing. Take, take, take the biblical evidence. Take what Jesus is saying here. And let's make an application. Um... This is why I'm opposed to opposed to this idea. Right? There's this idea in, uh, especially in the Western Church, that we make salvation or conversion, new birth. We, we make it formulated. We make it formulated. We, we make it that, uh, take this class, when you finish this class, we're going to have you make a confession of faith, and so, you know, October of next year, I'm going to get born again and make a confession of faith. Really? <laughs> um, are you the Holy Spirit? I, I, I didn't know that you could set a date and say, on this day, I'm going to get born again. And on this day, I'm going to come to Jesus. Right, right. The danger of that is whenever we see, and I, I did a paper on this years ago in Bible school, that uh, I went through all the conversions in the book of Acts when people converted to faith in Christ. And they were all done spontaneously. Spontaneously. It wasn't done on your plan, because these are not things you do. These are things that the Spirit of God does. It's like the wind. He moves wherever He wishes, whenever He wishes, on whoever He wishes. And he does it when He wants to do it. And so it's not a matter of systematizing it so that you, you know, hey, you took a class from the time you were 12 or 13 up to the time you were 16 or 17, and hey, on this said date, we're going to make a profession of faith, and we're all born again. The Bible shows nothing to that evidence. It is quite the contrary. Right? And this is kind of how we've made it in, in, our, in our culture, is that uh, in the systematizing of it is... We have a list of, you know, creeds or confessions. We have a list of doctrines. And we have a list of behaviors. We subscribe to the doctrines. We subscribe to the behaviors. And then we say that something supernatural has happened to us. Even though there's been no life transformation. There's no soft heart. There's no spiritual sight. There's no uh, regeneration that has taken place. There's no turning that has taken place. There's none of the fruits or evidences that the Spirit is present. It is all external. It is all formalism. It's all ritualized. Just like Nicodemus. Just like Nicodemus. This isn't something you can conjure up and make happen on a said date. This is something... Hear me, this is what it means to be born again and converted. My last statement. What it means to be born again and converted is just as we were looking at earlier in Acts 26, verse 18. The word is being preached. And while the word is being preached, the Holy Spirit moves upon an individual's heart and brings about new life, brings about this new birth, brings about being born again, born of the Spirit, born of God. And the next thing you know, it clicks. The light goes on 
And all of a sudden, what you couldn't see before and what meant nothing to you other than dead formalism, all of a sudden it comes alive. And now you can see. And it's not just a ritual or a tradition or just something you walk through. It's actually real. And the, and, and the response of the heart that has been born again is that now, all of a sudden, you begin to respond from the heart in faith and repentance and good works. But it all originated with this work of God, this move of the Spirit of God, that when you heard the Word, all of a sudden, one day, He turns the light on. And you'll know when that day occurs. And you'll know when that time occurs. And you'll have the experience of it and the reality of it. And you'll see the fruit of it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that... You have taught us things that are of you, that are supernatural, that are beyond our ability. That's the whole point of it. Something we cannot do, it is only something you can do in the heart, and it's spontaneous. You blow wherever you wish, whenever you wish, on whoever you wish at that moment. We don't control you, we don't regulate you, we don't say, hey, uh, such and such a time, and such and such a date, you're going to make us born again and we're going to believe in Christ. No, you do this on your own will, according to your own plan, your own purpose, whether we're 9 or 19 or 59. And you make these things come to pass. Of your own will and of your own choosing, not because of our family tree, not because we worked harder than somebody else, not because... Uh, of self-effort or self-will or self-determination, but because of the Spirit. We've lost this. It's all intellectual knowledge and mental assent, and we act as though you're not real and that there's not a reality to these things that we teach and we hear about. There is a reality that takes place. You are real, and you transform lives, and you... You, 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 you don't just clean the outside of the cup, but that you change the inside of the cup and make the inside of the cup clean. That is truly what it means to be born again, resulting in repentance and turning and conversion and faith in Christ. You must be born again. Lord, blow upon us, speak to hearts, convict us of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. In Jesus' name, we give you all the glory. Amen.